Hey everybody, Jazzy here. Back with the year 12 recap of Thrill of the Grill, my solo Warly world over on Twitch. It's going to be an interesting year. I got some big goals, but there's going to be a lot of curveballs thrown at me, and you'll see what I mean soon enough. But first, there's 25 crumpled packages to unbundle. We got two lights, which is fairly consistent with the mean average of getting lights once you learned all the Oasis prints. I think a more accurate assessment of your luck would be to count the number of lights versus trinkets, since it's a 1 in 6 chance of replacing a trinket. And we are finally planting down our houndius in our hound trap. Good timing too, because we get a hound wave about a half day later. Now the hounds appear to be pathfinding around the statues, but I think that's because I still have stone walls behind each statue. Once the walls get busted down, then the hound should get caught on the statues more consistently because they think they can just run over the walls. For anyone interested, here's the logic behind the corner statue design. Basically, I tried to have a corner for each season. So, Colossus and Deerclops for winter, Dragonfly and Antlion for summer, Moose and Malbatross for spring, and Berger and Bee Queen for autumn. I'd love a frog rain statue that's just this disgusting pile of frogs falling from the sky. Clay! Come on, let's go. Now, you know what else this hound trap is going to be really good for? Farming jet feathers. No, not from crows, from buzzards. Because the moment hounds start dying, the buzzards land and immediately start growling at me, which prompts the hound use's motherly instinct to protect me from danger. This is great. We're going to get monster meat, gems, jet feathers, and drumsticks every single hound wave. I didn't realize I was making a farm for bacon, eggs, and feather pencils, but... Okay! Clause number one of the year is gonna give me some scales, some jelly, and two lights! I returned from that victory full of self-assurance, but something was missing from my base. Curveball number one. I hate starting questions with the word remember, but... Remember that lure plant boat? Yeah, the one that mysteriously drifted away and I put an anchor on it? Yeah, it's gone AWOL again. Now fortunately I've been collecting plenty of lure plants, so I went ahead with setting up another lure plant boat, and I immediately caught eye of the missing one. What the actual hell? The anchor is down, so Wavy is ruled out, but even if something nudged it, it would have stopped eventually. The most credible theory that chat offered was this rot. You see that little piece glitching off the side of the boat? It's possible that that created the most microscopic bit of friction that had just been continuously nudging the boat for over a year. Whatever the reason, now we're going to have two lure plant boats. It actually might be nice to have two different sets of lure plants to pick meat from because you don't want to pick meat when it's close to spoiling. Oh yeah, lesson number two. Knock the lure plants down before moving boats. If you try jumping onto a boat and there's a lure plant on the edge, you will very likely just fall off the side and drown. This was honestly inevitable, and I was very lucky I didn't lose my handbat bundle. Always put your bundles in your backpack because they do sink. Okay, it is time to start preparing for a very important fight of the run. Misery Toadstool. Killing it's going to give us the knapsack blueprint which will let us duplicate shroom skins with green gems. So I'm excited to finally get around to this one so we can really start setting up all of our mushroom lights. First thing is to restock our weather pane supply. We are swimming in volt goat horns and gears, but the down feathers are definitely going to be the limiting ingredient here because each weather pane needs 10. So I'm going to use two construction amulets to craft 10 weather panes from 50 down feathers. I'm also bundling up a few thulacite crowns and pre-building an ice box. Okay, now we need to poison a canary. To do this, you put a canary in a bird cage in the caves. After a couple days, they will get poisoned and we can bundle it up until we're ready to fight misery. While the bird is marinating, we can hop around and locate the toadstool cap, which was exactly where we last fought Toad. This is a very convenient hole, because it's right next to the stairway to the mosaic biome. I'm back home making a few more preparations and check out what we get to fill our bundle with, Mokeka. We're getting a ton of fish from Oasis Summer Fishing and growing a bunch of tomatoes and onions, so it's time to put it all to good use. I can very easily see this dish replacing dragon pie in my bundle. It's just better for Warly. I can eat meaty stew plus mokeka when I'm starving, and it'll fill my hunger, it'll top off my health and my sanity. As far as restoration of stats go, I'm not sure if I'm gonna eventually need any other food. Here's how I imagine my eventual food bundle, okay? Meaty stew, mokeka, glowberry mousse, 
And the fourth spot I can swap out as needed. Fish cordon bleu for spring, for example, or volt goat jelly during a ruins trip. I'm back on the lunar island grabbing a bundle of glass axes for misery. I have a bunch left over from last toadstool, so I'm not gonna overdo it here. Besides, I'm also gonna have weather paints and honey chops, so I'm not gonna go through too many of these. Day 794, I'm doing some final prep for the fight. This is going to be the first fight I will get to use three different spices and a handful of Warly specialty foods. We got spicy Volt Gold Chauvois for damage. We got honey powder cake for chopping. We got fish cordon blue for rain protection and jelly salad for sanity. The last consideration is important because you lose a lot of sanity from holding a dark sword. Plus Toad has this massive aura drain while summoning spore caps. And that's it. We're ready to go. Back down the sinkhole, setting up for the fight. I'm picking all of the light bulbs and minerals in the area just to minimize the chance of Warly getting distracted when using the action button to chop spore caps. Okay, so now we need a wet toadstool cap to get that three times damage from the spicy jelly. So now we just need to wait for rain. In winter, it, it just needs to rain one time and then everything's wet for the rest of the season. So go ahead and rain. Curveball. You know, I recall a time when it rained a whole lot more often in the caves during winter. Like, things were pretty much guaranteed to be soaking wet by the end of the season, but lately I've been getting completely dry winters. I hope this is not one of them because we got a whole 10 days until spring. Well, while we're waiting, we can go grab some rocky turf, play a little bit of fire tag with the bats, maybe map more of the caves. I hate the caves in winter. Charging up thermal stone is so awkward in a lot of biomes, and if you wear a miner hat, then your thermal stone goes yellow really fast. So I'm basically burning guano to charge up the stone. I mean, as long as it's not raining down here, I can make a trip back home, drop off this turf, recharge my thermal stone. I literally cannot do anything until it starts raining. Over an hour later, the first drops hit my face. Last day of winter. I spent most of a season waiting on weather. My poor chat, I appreciate you more than words. So much more. All right, let's fire this up. Misery Toadstool, let's go. One of the key aspects of this fight is my positioning of this ice box. Now, Warley can't really carry around food because it spoils. So I'm placing the ice box where I can stand to lead Misery away from the hole. The farther away I can drag, the more time I'll have for free hits while it walks back towards the hole right before it spawns spore caps. I just need to be super careful to not drop a spore cloud on the ice box because it will spoil food inside if the fridge is open. I'm wearing a Magiluminescence so that I can get the spore clouds as far away from Toadstool as possible. This will reduce the chances of spore caps getting spawned inside a cloud, and I'll be able to use the axes for chopping a bit more. Eating honey sweetened foods doubles my work efficiency, and glass axes already chop at a two and a half times efficiency. With these two stacked, I'm getting a five times chopping efficiency, which means I can chop Misery's spore caps with just three swings. Now, as far as pacifying Toadstool goes, I brought down both pan flutes and ice staves. Misery will slowly build up in immunity to both, so I'm planning to switch off eventually. By the time you use a pan flute seven or eight times, it just doesn't really stay asleep for very long. So I'm starting with pan flutes, then once those stop working, I'll switch to ice staves. But I never get the honor of switching to ice staves because the king is dead. 11 minutes, 40 seconds. Congratulations, F tier. You just murdered the end game. Every Dark Sword swing was dealing about 204 damage. F tier gonna go farm some shroom skins now. But speaking of farm, there is another project I am itching to get to this year. I want the Lord of the Fruit Flies evicted from my farm for all time. And here's how we're gonna do it. First, we set up some farm plots out in the middle of nowhere. Then we plant some random seeds. Then we're done. As these crops grow, then spoil, then regrow, the timer's just gonna keep going down and eventually the Lord will make himself known to us. And that can be his dominion for all time. You only get one of these on a map, so as long as you never kill it, the rest of your farms are completely safe from pests. While those are growing, let's go for clause number two. The loot is a Malbatross bill, a Bee Queen crown, and two lights. That's pretty nice, actually. And back in time for the tomato rapture. Did I just make a fly zoo? You disgust me, Jazzy. You disgust me, Jazzy. 
Okay, I'm back in the caves now grabbing some cave rock and guano turf. Cave rock is an important turf to gather because it is one of the few natural turfs that block lure plants. Other examples include sandy, rocky, moon crater, ancient stonework, and rocky beach turf. But cave rock is definitely one of the more accessible turfs, and sandy turf I just never want to see ever again. Towards the end of spring, I finished up the turf around our hound trap. Eventually, I want to decorate this area with burnt structures, skeletons, pretty much anything that can't burn from red hounds. It'll be nice to add a little form to this build's function. And then it is back down to the caves for a summer of ruins clearing. I'm getting down here right at the start of the season so I can benefit from a wet cave system for a couple of days. It's getting me thinking about future ruins trips. Maybe spring would be a better time for me to clear because I can use Volco Jelly and just tear through all the clockworks and eat fish cordon blue if I'm trying to stay dry. Might be faster than getting all this done in summer. But yeah, I'll, I'll experiment. Believe it or not, the ruins were the least eventful thing of the year. Cleared in about 13 days. Ancient Guardian, dead day 833. Very nice haul from the chest. Three greens, four purples, nine thulacite, and a full thulacite suit. I mean, thank you. All right, I'm bringing back so much loot this year. I got a bundle of wires, sketches, nightmare fuel, gems, gears, green staves, lazy foragers, thulacite walls, and another houndius. Can't wait to add that last one to the collection. Next year we are going to go hunt for the Crab King, the final boss left standing. And then we can finally assemble the altars and summon the mysterious energy, and I'm sure that we will eventually have a very good reason to do so. I hope you enjoyed the recap, and I definitely hope to catch you next time live over on Twitch. Take care.